All right, Hurley Burleyites, let's get to it. Welcome to the only political podcast in Canada that can quote lines from PMO press releases right from 2004 to 2015 and also reveal that one of Paul Martin and Stephen Harper uses right guard deodorant, old school right guard deodorant in a can. And it's your guess as to which one. It's another Hurley Burley two-part pod for you today. For part one, we have Francis Donald in the Zoom box. Ms. Donald is Managing Director, Global Chief Economist, and Global Head of Macroeconomic Strategy at Manulife Investment Management. Now that's a mouthful. In 2019, at 33 years of age, she became the youngest Chief Economist in Canada and one of the rare ones to be a woman. Among other things, we're going to talk about the upcoming federal budget. What's the right budget for Canada and what's the next economy for Canada? Part two of the podcast is the political panel with our comms and campaign gurus, Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed. We're going to fight about conservative efforts to to deal with claims that they're far right or too associated with Trump. We're going to drive by Eve Bashett's drive by smearing of Omar Al-Gabra. And tomorrow is inauguration day down south. We're going to talk about transitions of power. And finally, with Biden's cancellation of Keystone, How will Trudeau play this, and what is Jason Kenney's next move? Plus, we'll throw out our hey yous into the digital ether and see if anybody bites this week. Francis Donald, welcome to the Hurley Burley. It is so good to have you here with us. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. I'm excited. Me too. Very excited. I've been reading so much about you and reading what you have to uh, say, and I'm very excited that my listeners are going to get a chance to talk to you. Let's just start, though, because... We're now in, I don't know, month 115 of the pandemic. And I want to know how you're doing. Thank you for asking that. Um, I'm exhausted. How are you? I'm both simul- simultaneously you know, experiencing way too much stimulus and also a little bit bored. I can't really square my head around it. I feel like there's so much to do and yet so much I want to be doing at the same time. It's a complicated set of feelings. But you know what? I'm healthy, I'm employed. That's a lot more than a lot of Canadians right now. So um, I'll deal with being a little bit more tired than usual. What do you really miss? Travel. I miss travel. One of the most amazing parts of my job is that I work for a Canadian company. I get to live in Canada. And actually, I just recently moved to Montreal. I get to live in Montreal And yet my job allows me to visit my colleagues in Hong Kong and London and Boston and New York. And it's this rare position to both be this proud Canadian and also have not only global input, but global influence. My team has members in Asia, London and the United States. And I feel like this is a really unique element to, to the gig and probably the part that I love the most. And I miss seeing other people in different areas and hearing their own perspectives and just being on the ground. So I I can't wait for that to come back. I think it's probably going to be a while. I can't really see myself getting on an airplane until 2022. Hey, how do you get to live in Montreal? Why don't you have to live in Toronto and go to work at that big complex they have downtown? Well, Toronto is a lovely place. Um, I'm actually from Montreal originally. I'm a proud Quebecer. I think this is a secret story about my life. Um, I grew up in a house where one parent was speaking French all the time. My husband grew up in a house where someone was speaking French all the time. Um, And so, you know, we really are, all of our family is here. So we're going to spend a little bit of time helping our family. They're going through a bit of a rough patch. Manulife has an amazing office in downtown Montreal. They call it Maison Manuvie. And we actually have a pretty big influence here. So it's going to be lovely to actually sit with some Quebec colleagues for a while, uh, learn a little bit more about what's happening in the business in Quebec. And I'm actually really looking forward to that. It's such a great city. I had the privilege of living there for a couple of years in my life. My God, what a great place to live. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. And there's a lot of really actually brilliant economists who are based in Montreal. There's actually a pretty large macro research center here in Montreal. People don't really realize that there's shops like BCA and, you know, um, Uh, a whole bunch of other shops that are here that are providing really great world-class research. So I've always thought Montreal was actually a little secret macro hub, and it's one of my favorite little takeaways about the city. Okay, so my my two co-panel, I got to ask you something personal. My two co-panelists were not very impressed with my shirt today. 
which is uh, Justin Timberlake. But, right. you know, you're 33, uh, quite a bit younger than my co-panelists. I'm hoping you've got some love for this shirt. Where are you on, where are you on this shirt? Well, listen, I'm 34 now, so it's a lot more maturity since last year. There's a lot of incremental advancements <laughs> between 33 and 34. Um, of course, what 34-year-old woman does not know Justin Timberlake? Actually, when people ask me about my best celebrity run-in, I ran into Justin Timberlake once. I was at his restaurant. When I lived in New York City, I went to his southern barbecue restaurant, and I went to the washroom. And when I came out of the washroom, I opened the door. He was passing through the hallway right in front of me. This is my big celebrity moment. And he said, excuse me, and walked right by. So it's hard for me to not really appreciate that you've worn this shirt. I feel like you, you wore it for me to really just capture my millennial intentions. Wow, it is such karma. It's amazing. It's such karma. So one of the interesting things I read about you, Francis, is that you had no idea you wanted to go into economics. In fact, the furthest thing from your mind until you read the book Freakonomics, and that Freakonomics intrigued you in economics. What was it about the book? I've read the book a long time ago. I don't really remember that much about it. What was the book? What, well, what motivated you about that book? So a lot of my youth actually was spent in more creative disciplines. You know, I was in theater. I loved that. I played the violin. I thought I was going to be a professional violinist for a long time. Um, you know, we had so much art in our house. My stepdad uh, partly owned an art gallery and everything in my life was about social sciences and history and really kind of this liberal arts. And I read this book, Freakonomics, just about the same time I broke my hand and realized my career in violin would be over. And it occurred to me that maybe this was a discipline that would help me kind of make sense of all these social sciences that I enjoyed of it. And it was the first time where I realized you know, you actually in this field can use a lot of creativity and storytelling and be very successful at putting all the pieces together. And I think, you know, this book is often quoted, it's you know well recognized, people think maybe they roll their eyes, oh, that's not real economics. But it, reading that book really set me up for a foundation in the career because even when I would sit there, you know, in graduate school, you're trying to break down proofs, you're in Cal like 400, it doesn't make sense to you. My mind always came back to what is the story that I'm being told underneath the surface? And this is how I actually have run my whole career is what is the story behind these numbers? How do we tell it? How do we tell people's truths and experiences? What is the data really trying to tell us about what's happening in the world? And then of course I realized, well, wait, I can take that one step forward and realize that if you understand what's happening to people's stories, you can actually trade markets pretty well and of course probably make a little bit more money doing that than just trying to advise on you know where jobs numbers are going and, and so that was sort of how I ended up working as what people would generally consider a financial economist whose job isn't just to say this is where GDP is going but this is where GDP is going and this is what it's going to mean to financial markets but really was a pivotal moment for me um, and I, I carried that same lesson with me my entire life in fact, I advise people constantly to think about the story behind the numbers. Um, I, I just did a TED Talk actually about this because I've always felt that people think economics is just boring numbers and proofs and maths and really economics is something that we all feel and experience every day all around of us. And as I say in the talk, we are actually all everyday economists. We've just been taught the profession wrong, in my humble opinion. Well, wow. so... Is it your ability to extrapolate narratives from the data that is responsible for your meteoric rise through this industry? <laughs> through this discipline? It's not an industry, through the discipline? Uh, I don't know if it's meteoric. I do feel pretty blessed. I've had a lot of people who took big chances on me. Um, but yeah, I mean, people often ask me what's the best career advice I could give them. And it's never, oh, you know, you need to study this book or, or read about this or learn, you know, interest rate theory. It's focus on your communication skills. There are a lot of really good economists and a lot of economists are better economists than I am. But if you can master speaking to different audiences, knowing how to frame a story, I don't think this is just relevant to economics. It's relevant to all professions. Communication is so key. It's also really hard. I mean, one of the challenges of my role is that one day I can be talking to you and we're just having a chat. Another day I could be talking to institutional clients in Asia. I could be going on CBC or BNN, very different audiences. I could be in a room in the old world with 600 people. They're eating dinner and they've got their silverware and it's clanking and half the people don't want to be there. 
finding the right tone for every individual audience is, you know, a huge part of the job. Uh, and really being that translator from the number of the chart on the screen into why it really matters, I think it's clutch. And I tell everybody to talk to, no matter what field they're in, focus on that, focus on public speaking, learn how to write. That can really be a big leg up for you in your career. I also, though, Dave, do get some trades right now and again. So uh, I don't think you can have one without the other. <laughs> yeah. Uh Econ economics is a is a punishing profession, right? If you get it wrong, I often I often ask myself, whatever happened to Lester Thurow? Lester Thurow in the early nineteen late nineteen eighties, early nineteen nineties was this guru of economics. Everybody was listening to him. The Kretsch government brought him in to speak to the government before they took office. I haven't heard of Lester Thurow in years and years and years, but of course he thought Japan was going to dominate the economy. Well, there were probably some clever reasons for that at the time, but you know, my career started actually in 2008. I was a very lowly research assistant at the Bank of Canada. Uh, and it was just an incredible time to start because in 2008, nobody knew what quantitative easing was. I mean, you could have the most senior individual in the group and they had sort of heard about what quantitative easing had done because Japan had been using some of it. But it was like a restart on a lot of the ways that we think about how our economic systems function and also how central banks function. That was a really critical moment. So, you know, you mentioned earlier, I, I'm very young to, to have this role. I'm very grateful to have this role. But a lot of that isn't just my own personal capabilities. It's that in some ways we all pressed refresh at that time. So, of course, a lot of economic identities that existed before 2008 exist after 2008. I strongly suspect, I just hired a young woman onto my team. I suspect she will be able to say the same thing in a decade because 2020 was also a reset in the way that we think about so many ways that the world works. Things like modern monetary theory. In 2019, people would ask me about that and I would say, ha ha, magic money tree isn't a real thing. Don't pay attention to it. In 2020, the biggest thing I talked about was what modern monetary theory was and why it was important that we pay attention to it. So this was also a big year of transition. Um, so, you know, there are still incredible economists that existed before this time and we have to listen to them because they have wisdom we don't. As an aside, I will say, nobody who's been working only since 2008 have, has ever seen real inflation or higher interest rates. So we best listen to people who have lived in different regimes. But, you know, there has been this sort of reset and it explains why maybe the sort of old regime of economists is not getting the attention that they traditionally have. As I said, though, I wouldn't completely dismiss their experience. It's possible that we head back into regimes that existed in the past. And I would be very happy to look up anyone who wrote about it. Okay, so let's talk about Canada and Canada going forward. There's going to be a budget this spring. There has not been a budget in a while. Um, this is a pretty important document. They, uh, among other things, have $100 billion set aside for investment uh, that they are going to articulate, presumably, at least in some measure, what they're going to use that for. They're going to have to put some more specifics around fiscal policy. Um and uh, I'm interested, just as a starting ground, hearing from you, talk just a little bit about what kind of budget does Canada need right now? I don't envy anyone who's putting together a budget, particularly around that timeline. So you, you basically put simply have two big concerns. The first one is that we are still in a massive recession. Um, and the first quarter of this year is going to feel a lot like a recession. Job losses are going to be higher. We're going to see more business failures. And that's just a function of the virus. I'd like to give you this very clever economic outlook. The economic outlook just depends on the path of the virus and therefore the path of vaccinations. It's just really that simple and also that complicated. So by the time we get to March, April of this year, we are still going to be dealing with very elevated unemployment and people who are genuinely suffering. When I say genuinely suffering, I mean, how do we pay rent? How do we make sure our children are not going hungry at lunchtime? How do we make sure that we're not having, you know, widespread deep depression elements for a lot of our population? One of the things I like to say a lot is the next 10 years is going to be like the roaring 20s for a segment, and it's going to be like the Great Depression for another. 
So heading into this period, we both have to have this sort of like urgent attention on an ongoing massive economic crisis, while also recognizing that it's hitting a certain segment of Canadians and not all Canadians equally. So one thing that I feel very strongly about is that prematurely pulling aid from COVID response is far worse for the economy than accidentally providing two to three months of extra support that maybe we didn't need in the end. What we have to do yeah. is keep this recession in the first half of the year from devolving into something that is much more like a Great Depression for a lot more Canadians. So that is the first fundamental focus. The second focus is that because of COVID, interest rates are extraordinarily low and because of COVID, the floodgates have opened on maybe we can spend more money than we thought we could. Maybe we can run larger deficits. So there is a little bit of an opening here to try to build back better. This is a term a lot of politicians are using. How do you do that? Well, economists will tell you. So this is what economists will tell you. I'm not the be all end all on how policy should be developed, but I'll tell you the economists think speak on this. Economists will tell you, you do things with high fiscal multipliers. If the federal government spends a dollar, do we get more than a dollar back over time? And things that make economists and markets like salivate, they can't wait, they don't even need to know what you're doing. Just say the word infrastructure, infrastructure. I don't even think that most of us really know what infrastructure means. Infrastructure, oh, let's buy Canadian. Transportation, just say the word highway. Oh my gosh, say the word highway. In the United States, I read all this stuff about what the Biden administration is going to spend. Highways comes up all the time. Just can't have enough of that. Infrastructure highways. Uh, say the word corporate competitiveness. Oh my gosh, greatest thing. Doesn't even matter what you do. Corporate competitiveness and trade. These are all things that, you know, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but all of these things we know help generate longer term growth. And yet underlying the surface, there are other things that can support the Canadian economy that maybe traditionally haven't come up. I'm a strong believer in childcare being a key economic infrastructure. It's not a social idea to me. It's economic infrastructure that helps our economy grow over time, that helps labor force participation, right? That does, sorry to use the cheesy term, pay for itself over time. And now there's this other component and that's green spending. So. I can't even believe I'm saying this, but the market demand for green spending is through the roof. Europe is putting together a massive package right now, and a third of it is going to be issuing green bonds and having people buy them and funding a green transition. So all that to say, you know, there's kind of these two segments. Help finish the job on COVID and help us build back better. Those are the two things. And yet I'd be remiss to not point out that there is a little element in the middle there, which is we need to focus on the next six months. We also need to focus on the next 10 years. What about the middle element? How do we help small businesses make sure that they get to the other side? How do we help them in the next two to three years? And that's a much more challenging part of the story. So that's gonna be things like wage subsidies, incentives for businesses, urgent corporate competitiveness, but that's where I sort of worry. And I, I don't, I'm not just saying this about Canada. I'm not saying this because I have any particular insight into what the budget looks like. But globally, we're very focused on those two kind of barbells, not enough probably on the middle, which is kind of bridging the gap to the other side. Okay. We can, um, it, it's pretty easy to get focused on what our situation is in the middle of COVID. But didn't we have a shitty economy before COVID? Like, even if COVID no. had never happened and you and I were having this conversation, we would be talking about sluggish growth and widening inequality and very slow, if anything, income gains for the middle class. And, uh, I mean, Canada's economy was underperforming before COVID, wasn't it? So, I, I wouldn't agree with your characteristic characterization because there were a lot of things that were working very, very well for the Canadian economy before COVID. We still had you know, very fundamental pillars, like we brought in uh, pretty substantial levels of immigration, which meant that we had higher potential growth over the longer term. This was something that a lot of countries were not doing. We had seen growth in places like the tech sector, for example, and we generally had pretty good employment numbers, even relative to the rest of the world. So, you know, was this a faltering economy before COVID? No. 
Did it have issues that could be radically improved? Absolutely. Were there substantial risks? Absolutely. And of course, the biggest one was housing. I mean, this has been one of the most peculiar developments is that we head into the greatest recession of all time. And what happened? Housing prices soar. Why? Completely atypical. They happened because the people who were hit by COVID were predominantly renters. If you look at the housing market across the country, rents are plummeting in really extreme ways, even though house prices continue to, to go higher. So that housing market is demonstrating to you what they call this K-shaped recovery, the haves versus the have-nots, or as I say, the roaring 20s versus the Great Depression. That is a really big problem now because those who were priced out of the market before are priced out now. I've often said we had a childcare crisis. Sorry to beat on the same drum, but if you live in downtown Toronto, it costs you more to send your kid from one to four years old to, to daycare than it does to send them to a University of Toronto arts and science degree. But we give parents 18 years, RESPs, government support in order to save for that. What are we thinking on that? That's really problematic. We, of course, had very problematic inequality issues. Maybe one of the silver linings of COVID is that we can shine a brighter light on that and there does seem appetite to fix it. We had, you know, this um, very segmented economy, energy versus non-energy. And that was very problematic for policymakers because things that helped your energy economy didn't necessarily help your non-energy economy and vice versa. So, you know, were there problems before that still exist now? Absolutely. But the beauty of it is that before, it cost us a lot more money to take out government debt to help solve those problems. And based on what I see, there wasn't as much appetite to, to help solve them. Now we're in an environment where interest rates are substantially lower. There's more appetite for government spending just broad-based, more appetite, more mainstream appetite for redistributive policies. We actually might be in a position to help alleviate some of these concerns. Where I don't know how we alleviate concerns is the housing market. This is really, really tricky because if you try to dampen the housing market, you hurt homeowners and that's like 70% of Canadians. If you don't try to dampen it, then you create these financial imbalances and these younger generations, you're those who are in the 20 to 40s, which by the way, are the people who were most impacted by COVID on a job loss basis. Also young families who we want to have a good life. Is that such a terrible thing to want for people? Maybe have some kids if they want to. Um, you know, there shouldn't be constraints on that to the same extent. This is something that I think is really, really challenging and not just challenging because, oh no, house prices are too high, but how do we contain them without hurting some people and helping others? That's, that's much more complicated. But, you know, to say that you know, the Canadian economy is still a very solid economy, a G7 economy with a lot of really beautiful elements to it. Is there room for improvement? Yeah. Do I see more scope for us to maybe make those improvements now than I did before COVID? Yes. So that makes me very optimistic. Okay. So how's your 2021 going so far? I know it's early, but mine feels suspiciously similar to 2020. I'm still locked down. I'm still hoping the carb loading works as some kind of COVID pre-vaccine until it's my turn to actually get the vaccine. Oh, and I'm still chug chugging onto the internet with no broadband available here at my cottage in rural Quebec. The cost to connect a community per premises increases in rural areas by nearly 2.5 times on average over non-rural areas. This is why our presenting sponsor, TELUS, needs the support of federal and provincial governments to make the build more economically viable. The federal government has announced a $1.75 billion universal broadband fund to accelerate getting high-speed internet to rural and remote communities. And TELUS couldn't be happier about it. Bridging the digital divide is TELUS's key priority. Over the years, they've invested nearly $200 billion in network infrastructure, operations, and spectrum. That includes connecting over 800,000 rural and remote Canadians in 110 communities and 56 First Nations. And TELUS service has been independently verified as the fastest rural broadband in Canada. But there's still a ton of work to do. Over the next five years, TELUS is planning to connect an additional 3.5 million rural Canadians, over 600,000 square kilometres. That's going to take the committed partnership of all governments, federal, provincial and Indigenous, to bring connectivity to rural Canada. TELUS is committed to building those relationships so that all Canadians can digitally access every opportunity through a world-class network. Go to connectingcanadaforgood.ca to learn more. Um, 
Where are you at on fiscal anchor? Do we need one? And what should it be? It's a great question. Um, so let me give you the market perspective. I don't think that global markets care as much about the so-called fiscal anchor as the general population. But who are who is a government serving general population, right? The problem with our fiscal anchors of the past, debt to GDP, is that in my opinion, well, it's not even an opinion, it's just fact, they don't take into consideration the cost of debt. So, you know, I don't always agree with making the comparison between people and governments, but you know, when you go to take out a mortgage, are you thinking about my brother actually is buying a cottage, very COVID-like. Um, I called him, I said, do you need help with your down payment? He said, I don't need help with my down payment, but my monthly payments are a touch high for me. Um, and this is exactly how governments should think about debt. And they do. They don't think about the total amount. They think about how much each month do I have to put towards paying for this? Just like we think about how much can we afford in a mortgage payment, not the total mortgage that we're taking out. Now, the problem with debt to GDP is that really is more about the total mortgage you're taking out than what your monthly payments are. So I wouldn't be in favor of a policy or a, a fiscal anchor that considers the cost of debt. And the reason this is a good idea is because as the economy gets better, interest rates will rise and interest rates will rise, which will make the cost of debt more expensive. And that will naturally restrain how much government spending we can have. So in a way, it's a little bit cyclical. In bad times, we should be able to help our economy and spend as much as we need to. In good times, we should try to have a little bit of a restraint. And Quebec actually already does this. They have sort of a cyclical way of thinking about debt. When you have sort of a large hit in the economy, you spend. When things are better, you pull back. And that way, you don't really handicap yourself if you're in crisis. What happens if next year, for example, uh, I don't know what does it. This is not in my forecast, but let's just play a hypothetical. What happens if next year there's a housing market crash and we go into a recession unrelated to COVID, but we've capped ourselves in debt to GDP and people are hungry? That would not be something that would be very good. If we say to ourselves, well, housing market collapses, interest rates go even lower, maybe they even go into negative territory, shocker, you know, that allows us to spend a little bit more. So I think we just need to broaden our concept of what a fiscal anchor really is. 2020 was not the time for a fiscal anchor. It was time to help people. It was time to avoid a financial crisis, a Great Depression. In 2021, we're going to want to see some evidence that governments around the world are just really trying to be more measured and segmented in their priorities ahead. Um, so, you know, if we go another year without a fiscal anchor, you're not going to hear me complaining about that very much. What I want to see is a lot more reference to debt servicing costs, your monthly payment for your mortgage, not how much mortgage you took out. Does that make sense? Does that seem fair to you? Well, I guess my, my question, my question about all that is without any fiscal anchor, See, I believe they have one. So can you simplify this for me? If you don't have any idea of what the limits are of what you can afford, how do you say no to anybody? On what basis are they saying no to anything if they don't have some sense of what's affordable? There's a million legitimate claims out there. And for most years, people have been told there's no money for those kinds of things. Um, but for instance... If you don't, if you don't have any intellectual constraint on what you're spending, how do you make the choices that are required for a budget? Well, that's why thinking about what your monthly payments towards that debt are really important because, you know, you and I, when we're deciding, you know, what can be the size of our mortgage, if someone said your mortgage is $3,000 a month versus $1,500 a month, that would constrain. That's how you know how much you're supposed to afford. So what we want to avoid is the 1990s when we took in $100 in the government, we spent 35 of those dollars just paying for the interest on our debt. That's really problematic. That's when we get to the point where instead of saying, okay, we took in $100 and we're going to spend $5, which leaves us $95 for our other expenditures, it went up to $35. So we were constrained. It was like you bring home money and half of your paycheck just goes towards paying the interest on your credit card. That's a terrible, terrible situation. And it constrains how much you can create in your economy because that's your real constraint. My issue is not that 
you know, we should have a free for all is that let's be real about what really constrains us. And what really constrains us is not the total amount of debt we've taken out. It's how much it costs us every month. Now, the problem, and many people have made this excellent point, is if you take out a massive mortgage and you let's say you have a variable rate, which effectively governments do, and interest rates start to climb, then all of a sudden that portion gets much bigger. So you have to bake in very reasonable expectations. Now, right now, we're in a situation where interest rates are likely to stay very low for a very long period of time. Is this me saying free pass, you can spend as much money as you want? Absolutely not. But it does give us more runway. So when we think about, you know, when I said I don't think markets care as much about fiscal anchors as the general population, what I mean is that markets care a lot about the destination for that money. They want to know, is it going to boost growth? Are we going to see more small businesses that are in action? Is it going to create more employment? That's what we really care about. We need time for that money to create that. Usually it takes up to four years for government money to really be felt in the broad economy, particularly with investments. The benefit of the environment that we're in now is we've heard from central banks. They're not going to be raising interest rates till at least 2023. My own view is it's at least 2024. And even when they do raise interest rates, it will be extremely gradual. I don't see any major central bank raising interest rates above 2% in the next decade. It would take a really extreme scenario for that. So we have this long runway where government money that's put to work now has a longer time to recoup the benefits. That's the beauty of this current situation. And I wouldn't want to like falsely handcuff ourselves and not help these issues, these issues that you point out. Mass inequality, needing to make green transitions. Now is the moment where we have the most amount of time to do that. And time is a really key component of the story. So that when interest rates get up to 2%, let's say that takes six, seven years, our economy is running at higher potential, the government has more tax revenues coming in, and that's a little bit less painful. Just think it's more complicated than trying to put a ratio together and saying, that's exactly how much you can have. It's arbitrary and it doesn't take into consideration the real thing that constrains us, which is our monthly payments and the cost of that debt. Okay. Um, is this an absolute consensus among economists or are there right-wing economists out there? Well, I know that there's Jack Mintz out there who's saying something different. Is it, but is, there, is this something that divides economists largely or is there a consensus about this? I don't know. When I just hang out with economists, spending. yeah, no, we, we just talk about like Justin Timberlake and drink some beers and how hard it is to put a <laughs> forecast together. Um, so, you know, there, is, there are a lot of different types of economists, Dave. I think that people don't really recognize this. There are academic economists, so professors, for example, who all got PhDs and then you tried to get put into the best place and they, they're the ones that teach you and they write research. There's policy economists who devote their life and sometimes I think they're public servants. I don't think they get paid very much money. They work in these centers. They work really hard to try to advise on the best way for us to move forward, usually on social issues. Then you have, you know, bank economists. Those are the economists who help large financial institutions guide their way. They create forecasts that help them drive their business forecasts forward. I mean, this is also true for places like Amazon. A lot of the people that I went to my NYU master's with work at Amazon as economists, right? Crazy place. And then you have uh, sort of where I am, which is financial economists, who uh, really it's the dark side of economics. Let's just be real. We're not really trying to help people. We're just trying to figure out how markets run. Within financial economists, I would say that, yes, it is consensus that a firm fiscal anchor is not you know, something that people really want. But what financial markets want to see is that you aren't degrading your long-term ability to pay your bills. So what financial markets worry about is not, do you have a debt to GDP? It's that if I buy your bonds, so remember when the government wants to spend money, it says, okay, I'm going to issue a bond. Uh, I need someone to buy that from me. And other people essentially lend the federal government money. When you buy a Canadian government bond, you are lending the government money and they say, I will give it back to you in whatever, five years, 10 years, depending on the maturity of your bond. And I'll give you a little bit extra. These days, it's really a little bit extra. It's like 0.25, right? Over that. What financial markets care about is the possibility that that government cannot repay you. That's what financial markets fear. If I lend money to one of my brothers, I know for sure he's going to pay it back to me 
my younger brother, he pays it back to me all the time. I don't charge him very much interest at all. I've got another brother who has like a 50% return rate on the money that I lend. I, if I could, would charge him a 10% return. I would say, I'll lend you the money, but you got to give me 10% back because you, my sir, are a very risky person to lend to. So financial markets care about your ability to pay back. So they do care about the sustainability of your spending. But do they care if your debt to GDP is 34% or 38%? No. Here's another thing financial markets care about. If you're sitting in Paris and you're a, a portfolio manager, you can invest in a lot of countries. You could buy Canadian bonds, you could buy US bonds, you could buy German bonds. Nobody is forcing anybody to buy Canadian bonds. So a lot of the time financial markets will say, okay, if I could choose between the US and Canada, which one has the higher likelihood of paying me back? Well, in this case, Canada's debt numbers look far better than most other G10 countries. So if you're just looking at Canada relative to the rest of the world and you wanna say, who's, bond, who's most likely to pay me back? It's not an absolute. It's a relative. And that's why, you know, people ask me all the time, like, what, how much money should Canada spend? Canada should spend less than its peers. Canada should have debt relative to GDP that is less than its peers. That's more of a constraint on whether, you know, global markets are going to buy Canadian debt than just the absolute number. So again, you know, we need numbers in our budgets. We need to see some evidence that all governments globally are trying to avoid the situation that you described, which is free for all. But does it have to be exactly the debt to GDP ratio over time? Is that really the most appropriate way to do it? I don't think so. I think we handcuff ourselves and we limit our potential by doing that. Okay. So let me, let me challenge your economic expertise on something. Go for which it. Which is, you said interest rates are going to be low for a very long time. Um. And uh, that is the assumption that everybody is operating on. Uh, the Bank of Canada has only one mandate, and that is to keep inflation within its band of 1% to 3%. Oh, you're going to regret bringing um, me here, Dave. Go for it. Okay. And <clears throat> they maintain that that's exactly what's driving their policy right now, is to prevent deflation. So... Interest rates have been rock bottom since the 2008 crash, rock bottom, mm -hmm. and governments have been putting significant stimulus into the economy. There is no inflation. My understanding, first of all, you're going you're gonna to correct me on that, and that's going to take us down a different rabbit hole. You're going to say there's a difference between CPI and real human inflation, and I'm very interested in that conversation. But the bank works on CPI, so let's just stick with that for a second. Okay. Okay. My understanding, and now correct me, is that there is no economic theory that explains why there's no inflation. And so we are basing our long-term expectation that interest rates will stay low on something we do not understand. Okay. Um, so first of all, I get asked about inflation a lot and the question is not nearly framed as well as and intelligently as you've just put it. So thank you. So yes, we do know why inflation is very low. Um, and it, it is an economic theory. So first of all, when I talk about inflation and the CPI, know that there's two ways that you can calculate CPI. One is what we call a top down, which is all the broad macro factors. They're like big line items that help us broadly explain price pressures. The other component is what we call bottom up, which is that there's all these line items within the CPI, things like um, they call it owner's equivalent rent, but it's, it's house prices. Uh, how much does food cost? How much does gas cost? So there's two ways you can arrive at an inflation forecast. You can look at these broad trends and say, you know, when the output gap does this, inflation does this. And then the other way you can do it is calculate all the little line items from the from the bottom up. Now, most of the time, economists are going to take the top down per, top down perspective. Now, there's a couple reasons why measured inflation. I won't go down your rabbit hole. Why is CPI low? Well. Broadly, globally, there's a lot of things going on. We generally call it the three Ds. I don't know I said we. I call it the three Ds. It's just my clever approach. So one is massive amounts of debt. 
When debt is this extraordinarily high, we know that puts a downward pressure on inflation. The second is demographics, a substantially aging population. You know, all the time I hear people say, you know, the world is overrun with people and we have too big of a population. Well, that may be true, but know that the world birth rate actually peaked in 1965. And that was, I believe, four children per woman, which is like exhausting to me. I have one, I'm so tired. And now, you know, that number has fallen really precipitously. And in a lot of major economies, including Canada, the birth rate is below the replacement rate. And our population is aging pretty substantially. That changes consumption dynamics, it increases savings, and it puts a lot of downward pressure. The biggest, the two biggest other reasons, the, the biggest reason we've seen in the last 10 years in particular, low inflation, is digitalization of our economy. It's profoundly deflationary. This is basically our ability to access information, services for free in some cases. So I'll give you an example. Um, back in April, when we were trying to move, we were driving along the 401 and a tire blew out on the side of the 401. It was just my husband and, my, and me. We had boxes in our trunk. And I was so distraught because I was like, I forgot to renew the CAA. We're in the middle of the pandemic. Who's going to come rescue us? And my husband said, no, I'm pretty sure I know how to do this. And he watched a YouTube video on how to change a tire and just did it in front of me. It was actually extremely attractive. I was like, well, look at this. I got this manly man here who can just change a tire. This sounds like a silly story, but it's exactly what disinflationary pressures are. We never called CIA. We got information for free. We did it ourselves and it cost zero dollars, apart from the fact that we had to get a new spare tire after the fact. Well, this is happening massively. Have you done, um, you know, what are the things that you learn on the end? You know how many times I'm going to go to the doctor and then I just Google it, which you're not supposed to do, by, by the way. Uh, how much information are we getting for free? I listen to music for free a lot of the time, or I pay a very small amount to have Apple music and I never buy CDs anymore. What about our cell phones? Our, you know, in the CPI, you have things like flashlights, notepads, cameras. I don't have those things anymore. I have a cell phone, right? So this digitalization is not going anywhere. So when people tell me that we're going to see this massive inflationary push, I'm like, okay, well, we still have these long-term structuralizations. But the other area where we had big disinflationary pressure was globalization. So you can look at the cost of doing business, like the world average tariff rate, and that peaked in the 1930s and has been falling ever since. Now, one argument that does make sense, and this is why my inflation forecast for after COVID is a little bit higher than pre-COVID, is that the world average tariff rate is turning around a little bit. That's because of Brexit. It's because of US-China uh, trade negotiations. We are seeing a bit of a move there. So the cost of doing business abroad is actually rising a little bit. And that could actually put some pressure on CPI higher. But generally, yes, we, we know why inflation has been very low over this period. What I don't know is why we're still targeting 2% inflation if we are pretty clear on why it's low. Is that really the appropriate target? So it's no surprise to me that central banks globally have expanded the amount of research they're doing. They now do a lot of research on inequalities. The Federal Reserve in the United States focused pretty, pretty strongly on that. They just had a conference last week on it. Bank of Canada, extremely focused on climate change and what climate change does to the economy and what the central bank can do. So their focus is expanding sort of indirectly away from that 2% target to broader things. And why I say that interest rates are likely to stay low is not because I don't think, you know, we could see 2% inflation. The reason I say that is because their new expansion of research tells them that they have to keep interest rates lower now than they did 10 years ago. Or in their speak, the neutral rate, where interest rates should be in the longer run, is lower now than it should have been historically. It's probably 1.75 to 2% for, for, for interest rates. So you know what I think is more important than just when we start seeing interest rates rise is how high they go in the next cycle. And in my view, they're probably not going higher than 2%. Note also that central banks have been moving towards average inflation targeting. Have you heard of this? This is like very focused in the United States right now, but it's ultimately happening everywhere. Is that the Federal Reserve told us, you know what? We've undershot 2% for so long, we actually have to overshoot 2% for a sustained period of time. 
We don't know what sustained means. It probably means over 2% for at least a year. But globally, central banks are doing this. They're saying 2%. Yeah, we still have 2%. We didn't change anything, but we could definitely, definitely have over 2% for a period of time. So what that tells me is that even if we got 3% inflation for a year, central banks would not necessarily react to that. I think you're right. You know, we, we spend so much time saying the central bank's mandate is 2%. But I don't know that central banks still fundamentally believe that to this, in the same way and in the same format that they did historically. I hope that answers your question. Does that seem fair? Um, it was a great answer to that question. And uh, the political critics of the Bank of Canada would say that it is compromising itself to do its job because of the lending it is doing to the government of Canada. And that uh, the amount of lending it's doing to the government of Canada means it really can't raise interest rates even if it ought to because uh, the government is depending on it for a source of low-cost money. Respond? Respond to that? Okay, so... Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so the government, the Bank of Canada is not directly lending money to the government. That is debt monetization. It's not what's happening. It's not like the government calls up the Bank of Canada and says, print me some money I want to spend. That would be debt monetization and modern monetary theory. The government of Canada is issuing bonds. And in order to keep interest rates low, the Bank of Canada is buying a significant segment of them. Problematically, the Bank of Canada has bought a lot of these bonds. Since March, they've bought about 76% of all the new debt issued. By then of next year, the Bank of Canada may own as much as half of all outstanding Government of Canada debt. That's sizable. And it's much higher than the United States, which is at about 20%. It's not, it's about equivalent where Europe is. It's less than what we see at the Ricks Bank, for example. But it's sizable enough that, of course, the Bank of Canada is sitting there going, we may actually be creating distortions in our bond market. Is this market trading as much as it would have historically. So the number one key takeaway that we should have, the number one pushback I have against that view is that the Bank of Canada was the first major economy to taper its purchases. It did this back in September. It was the first major one to say, we have been buying a lot. We're actually going to reduce how much we're buying. And they're probably going to continue to do that. While they do that, they'll shift the duration of what they're buying. So in the past, they were buying things that were a shorter tenure, so two, three, five years. And now they're buying less, but more of the tenure later. So what they do is they flatten interest rates over the longer term horizon. The Bank of Canada being the first mover on this is very telling. It says that they take their independence mandate extremely seriously. However, it's complicated because if the Bank of Canada wants to raise rates, it knows that that has to lower government spending. And if government spending falls, the economy slows and you get less inflation. So if they see inflation is really materially to the upside, then it makes sense to do that. That's one of their levers. Raise interest rates, less government spending, inflation comes down a little bit. But if inflation is around 1.92%, it's sort of good enough they want to normalize interest rates, but they don't want inflation to crash to 1.5%. It probably keeps them on hold longer. So in 2020, I wrote a piece. Um, actually, no, it's going to be my 2021 outlook. I can't keep the years straight, Dave. It's just so overwhelming. My 2021 outlook uh, talks about seven disruptors for 2021 and the way that we see the world. And the number one disruptor is the blurring of monetary policy and fiscal policy roles. It's not concrete. The Bank of Canada is not funding the government, but is their relationship getting more complicated? Yes. And it's gonna be a really big challenge for the Bank of Canada to disentangle itself from that. I think they can because the history of the Bank of Canada is so aggressive about its central bank independence, but it's more complicated now. What I will say is that can you imagine what would have there's happened? There's a trade-off, surely, had... between there's a trade-off, surely, between independence and what you're assuming your mandate to be. And the broader its mandate gets, the less independence it can have. Because we're, we're veering into policy territory, right? 
Well, this is why I say the blurring of the line. So central banks looking at inequality and spending. And, you know, there's another thing that you may not have heard of this um, that is fascinating to me, and that's the concept of central bank digital currencies. So the idea behind a central bank digital currency, it's not a crypto, it's not backed by blockchain is the idea that a government could, or a central bank, sorry, could print money and that we'd all have digital wallets. And instead of buying government bonds, QE, that money would flow directly into those who specifically need it. That would be a way to give stimulus to those who are, as I say, hungry, literally. This would be a big game changer because this would change the way that central banks effectuate stimulus. And if this sounds like, oh my gosh, that would never happen to you, the Bank of Canada is currently hiring a head of central bank digital currencies. The Bank of International Settlements has massive research on this. China already has one. It's called the digital yuan. So, you know, our concept of what central banks do, and maybe this sounds so crazy that I would even say this, but what central banks do is changing a little bit. And it's, I think, you know, motivated the right way, which is to say that our methods quantitative easing just lifted the stock markets and didn't help income inequality. But how we think about central banks also has to change. I don't think it's fair to say that this is nefarious or wrong. If our end goal is a more prosperous Canada, one that's more inclusive, that global markets want to buy into, that people want to live in, that has plenty of businesses, then maybe we do have to change the way our central banks work. And just to say outright, they shouldn't be doing that because that's not their mandate isn't right. The question should be, what is a central bank's mandate? And have we gotten it wrong the whole time? Okay, that's, that's super interesting. It's certainly going to bring them into the realm of politics more than they've been involved in the realm of politics before. They're already there. They're already there. How many times is it coming up in, you know, in the, the comments? You know, it's, it's already there. So I got one last big question to ask you before we're going to have to wrap up and this is my own personal belief so just indulge me my own personal belief is that the economy we have is making rich people too rich and poor people too poor without scrapping capitalism what do we do about that i share your personal belief this is why i say it's the roaring 20s for some and it's a Great Depression for others. But it's not just a personal belief anymore. The you know, realm of research coming out tells us that this is restraining growth. There are a lot of really good books coming out saying, from very credible economists saying, wait, GDP? Is that what should we, we should be targeting? There's a great book that just came out, When More Is Not Better. Maybe that's something we need to look at. Scott Galloway very famed NYU professor wrote a book post COVID or post Corona I'm trying to see what the exact title is talking about how detrimental this is on our ability to grow. I don't think what we live in is true capitalism. If we lived in true capitalism, we wouldn't have the same amount of government interference that we currently have. I think we have the worst form of capitalism, which is that we say that we have these free markets, but really, we have massive amounts of intervention, very high taxations, uh, particularly, you know, globally, not just the Canada thing. We don't always let bad companies fail. And we have a lot of money that is maybe not heading towards the right places. So my first step is saying, let's stop pretending that we live in true capitalism and start recognizing that we live in a distorted form of it. Number two, is can we at least allow our, our policymakers, particularly the central banks, to explore these issues without telling them they're becoming political? Can I at least talk about income inequality as an economist and have it not be viewed as, as being a socialist? You know, for years, I would talk about childcare as a piece of economic infrastructure and the mean tweets I would get on this, uneducated, communist, socialist, you know, probably votes for so-and-so. None of that was true. All of that view was just based on the idea that this would help income inequalities and support women and help our economy grow over time. This last year, the CEO of Scotiabank called for childcare and he was basically called in like an enlightened progressive. So, so smart to call for that. 
let us have these conversations without trying to make them political. Let us try to find a solution for income inequality, recognizing that that can support growth over the long time, long term. Let's allow ourselves to make some mistakes and not get it perfect. We're trying to reverse something that's existed for almost a century, which is the widening gap of inequalities. We're not going to get it right in the first shot. Let's just take a moment and think, you know, outside the box, recognize that inequality is not political, that in, when we try to defend inequality, we're not saying capitalism is bad. What we're saying is that our current system is not working for the growth of our economy. And and just kind of take a breath and a step back and, you know, a allow ourselves to have that conversation without it being something that gets you a mean tweet calling you a communist. That would be my ultimate wish. And then, of course, I could send you all the papers on specifically which policies. But broadly, let's start there. So let's pretend I read Thomas Piketty and have uh. concluded that we need to have a wealth tax. What would you say to that? I would say redistributive policies are coming, but again, it's not as easy as debt anchor or, or, or capital tax. We still have to be in an environment where, um, you know, we're plugging the right holes. So one of the issues with COVID is if I only have six minutes on like a CNBC slot, I'll use the term we have to dig ourselves out of the hole that was created by COVID, but it's wrong. What happened is that we have a series of mini holes and we have a series of mini house uh, hills. So we have areas of the economy that are underserviced and areas of the economy that are overserviced. We have areas of the economy that are undertaxed and areas of the economy that are overtaxed. One thing that drives me crazy is that we tax Torontonians the same federal tax as we tax people who live in Winnipeg. That doesn't make sense to me. I'm not a tax policy expert. So when we talk about a wealth tax, I think most economists will agree, absolutely, let's start working on redistributive policies. But a blanket wealth tax across everything is not really going to work, just as UBI, for example, probably doesn't work on the other end of the spectrum. Let's be more targeted, sectored regions, and more clever about the way we think about this. Um, but first step, of course, is to just be open to the idea. And then it comes down to policy design. Okay. Can you just drill right down? You sound like you have a problem with a wealth tax. What is the problem with a wealth tax? No, I don't have a problem with a wealth tax. What I'm saying is no matter what we're taxing, it cannot be uniform across all sectors and regions. It has to be targeted to the right income levels. It has to be targeted to the right regions, for example. I would not want to put the same wealth tax on the same income level in Toronto that I would on Calgary, for example. Explain that to me. Why is that? What would be the difference regionally? Why would you differentiate Toronto from Calgary? Well, a lot of it is cost of living, for example. So what is middle class in Toronto is a very different income bracket than what middle class is in Winnipeg. Costs of childcare, food, for example. So regionalizing it is very important. Now, I suspect if we wanted to put a wealth tax on anyone making more than 25 million, that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is that 200,000 in downtown Toronto is different than 200,000 in other regions. So blanket national does not always function to the best of everyone's hopes and dreams. That's why I'm saying now, of course, when you change taxation rates, you affect labor and immigration and where people move and choose to go. That's always a critical element as well. What I'm saying is, you know, just saying I want a wealth tax 5% on everything for everybody across the board. I don't think that's clever policy design. Okay. I said I had only one big question left for you, but I lied and I'm going to take us okay. well over time. And I'm okay. going to drag you into. I'm going to drag you now into the area of foreign policy. Okay. Okay. China is emerging as a great geopolitical threat to the Western democracies. Uh, is approaching foreign policy in a predatory way, as we Canadians know all too well, uh, with the kidnapping of two of our citizens. There are people who are international experts who are urging us to take a more forceful, realistic approach to China, 
which would likely have implications for the kind of economic ties and trade deals that we have with them. How much does Canada's economy rely on good relations with China? If we were to uh, end up at a major standoff that had big trade implications with China, how much would that hurt us economically? The Canadian economy is tied to the U.S. economy. It's three quarters of our exports. And the next biggest trade partner is um, China, which is closer. I think it's sub 5% of total exports. Our trade relationship with the United States is so substantially far and above more important than any other major economy. And that said, that seems like a good thing right now. But diversifying trade, of course, is a long-term policy objective. Asia is a massive growth engine, and that's not China-specific. Asia will continue to grow in its world dominance. And if we want to move towards trade diversification, that's critical. But in the next two years, what matters to Canada is the United States. And here's the, here's the point, commodity prices. So... I spend a lot of time thinking about China because of their influence on global FX markets and commodity prices. I, you know, the, the, the trade relationship is something that very rarely comes into my purview or how I calculate any type of forecasts because it just doesn't really sway where my GDP is going. Again, I know that I always say it's more complicated than that. The other transmission mechanism we have to be wary of is if there's, whenever there's bad headlines about Canada, it does weaken the Canadian dollar. So for example, we saw headlines about uh, Biden not being so excited about Keystone. What happened? Canadian dollar weakened, not by a lot, but when you see headlines like that, and there is a view, something that is maybe not totally advantageous to growth, the Canadian dollar does weaken. And if the Canadian dollar weakens, that has implications for Canadians. It makes the food that we eat more expensive, for example. It doesn't, however, really impact jobs beyond that it actually helps us have more exports to the United States. So, you know, I am not a foreign policy expert because the things that you're talking about don't flow into the way that I calculate GDP. Maybe that's a mistake, but currently when we look at how many jobs are gonna happen in Canada, when we look at what growth will be, we just look at the US. For a long time we've said, you don't really have to be a Canadian economist. If you're a Canadian economist, you spend 90% of your time just reading the US. So if I could summarize, what you're telling me is there is no reason for Canadian foreign policy to be constrained by economic concerns. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you will not see, you know, when we develop long-term forecasts, that is not generally an input into the way that we construct GDP. Does that mean that it couldn't have an influence? Not at all, because there are so many factors that go into these things. How is the policy developed? Which sectors is it hitting, for example? If you cut all ties with any economy, of course you might see a downgrade. But that has to be weighed about what the upsides are over the long term. So, you know, what is the opportunity cost of that? What is the immediate hit to growth? Maybe it's little. Maybe the opportunity co cost is much higher. I haven't looked at it. There are probably other people who have. But the fact that I haven't looked at it is either an error or it suggests that it's not flowing directly into our forecast for the next four years, which is what my forecast horizon is. Francis, my, my listeners have an insatiable appetite for economic uh, ideas, and you've been just fantastic today. It's been a great conversation. Oh, thank you. And you have educated me uh, a great deal, and uh, it's been fun as well. Thank you for doing this. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. People are always telling us to be safe nowadays. Hope you're safe. Be safe. Stay safe, you know. CN, our sponsor, does not need to be told. Safety is nearly an obsession at CN. It sort of has to be. When you have massive locomotives hauling millions of tons along thousands of miles of track, from the Atlantic to the Pacific to the Gulf of Mexico, playing games around trains or getting in their way never goes well. Ever. So CN preaches safety to all its employees. Meetings at CN always start with talk about safety. The company's experts do constant risk assessments along its routes. They test hundreds of thousands of miles of steel track a year. 
CN sends teams of specialists to towns and cities across North America, training tens of thousands of firefighters and other emergency personnel on how to deal with the dangerous goods trains sometimes carry. And the railway provides first responders with a special mobile app that lets them view the contents of rail cars simply and quickly. Most people don't realize it, but CN has its own police force, real badge-carrying peace officers who spend a lot of their lives working to prevent collisions or other tragic occurrences at crossings. Yes, some people are still tempted to trespass onto tracks or beat oncoming trains, which is always a really terrible idea. Because of their mammoth proportions and the laws of inertia, locomotives always look like they're traveling slower than they really are and can take a long time to stop. If a train hits a truck or a car, the truck or car loses every single time. I could go on from here, but you get the idea. When the people at CN stay, stay safe, they mean business. Hey, Jenny, Scott, good to see Hi. you. It's Tuesday. It's time for the panel. Hi. How are you? Great. I'm pumped. Now, by the two of you. By the look of the two of you, you might have been doing the same thing last night. Is there any, what were you guys up to last night? Yeah, well, I was uh, I was watching the uh, uh, second back-to-back uh, -back game uh, between Edmonton and uh, Edmonton and the Habs, and I like what I'm seeing this year so far. And I dig your hat, Jenny. Nice Thank you. red Habs hat. I've got my Henri Richard um, C jersey on, also in recognition of the tremendous team. I'm ex I, I like. I know I'm going to jinx this thing. I'm totally going to fuck this up. But I believe we got a good team for the first. It feels like they can find the net. There's yeah. some energy. Uh, it's not a whole team of third line grinders for the first time. It feels like in 60 years. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about Suzuki, Romanoff, um, Anderson. Romanoff like, I'm just I'm, I'm in a I good know. mood for the first time. And I don't know, since uh, <laughs> we left the Prescott in 1993, David. <laughs> um, Romanov got his first. Romanov got his first goal yesterday. So, uh, uh, to your point, Suzuki's looking good. Price is he well. Plays so Jake smart, Allen but... actually. What a good, what a good backup goalie. Like what a good number yeah. two goalie he is. He played a good game last night. I saw Coach Kinyami only got nine minutes. What's going on there? I don't know. He's. Uh, uh, he hasn't. I don't think he's got a point this year. He's been a little less, a little less visible. So has uh, I've thought Gallagher, um, who is my son's uh, favorite player. I've thought Gallagher has looked a little less energetic than he usually does. Guys like Suzuki and stuff suddenly make him look pedestrian and slow. But yeah. I'm hoping that shifts. Weber Weber right. has had a, had a good couple of games as well. So it, it you know it's uh, it's it's good that he's playing well as he approaches his fiftieth birthday. <laughs> He was he was just ahead of me in <laughs> elementary school. <laughs> he used to get his skates when he was uh, done with them. All right. We have news this week. We have news to talk about this week. Let's start with Derek Sloan. Derek Sloan is out as of last night. Um, is he officially and out? I, isn't the vote it's happening? It's a process, right? Yeah, because under the Reform Act that, that Sean brought in, it's not as simple as what it used to be in our days when, you know, someone could be removed from caucus uh, uh, easily. I think there has to be an official vote uh, to, to uh, actually get rid of someone in caucus. And, and uh, so I think it's happening now. From what I've heard, it's, it's, less, about, uh, it's less about the donation issue, which, which is kind of a bit of a murky issue as to whether, uh, as to whether he should have been removed for that. Uh, but the fact that he has uh, almost no friends in caucus, which uh, uh, it seems to be more of uh, uh, more of the issue than anything else. But Aaron O'Toole used to be his friend in caucus. Apparently, Aaron O'Toole stood up for him uh, during the leadership when there was a move to censure him. I believe he was. Yeah. I believe uh, if you believe the Facebook ads, Aaron was the only caucus member to stand up and defend Derek O'Toole, Derek Sloan. He bragged about it. Yeah. I'm in Sloan's corner. I'm with Sloan. <laughs> um, yeah. But this is your point, David, which is people overlook. As somebody who, um, as somebody who contemplated in 1990 how we could possibly get away with doing a deal with Tom Wapel if that would vault us past Gretchen, I know how these leadership things work and what kind of commitments and promises people make to get those jobs. Right? So... 
and Tom when you're there, you, yeah, Tom Wapel. Listen, I, I, say, I man? think I've. I think I've said this on the podcast before. I think that Derek Sloan probably never should have been allowed to run uh, run for MP in the first place uh, in Hastings Frontenac leading into the 2019 campaign. That's something that uh, that 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 falls on the Andrew Sh- like that falls on on Andrew Shear and, and the party for uh, letting him run uh, in the first place. I'm not sure if if it is solely about the issue of his campaign uh, receiving 131. Uh, dollars from uh, Paul or Frederick from I, I I think it's I think it's believable that not everybody would know who um, uh, not everybody would know who that was does this thing just go away now like or and I don't mean the big thing I as I articulated last week I still think there's a bigger reckoning I think this gives O'Toole a big symbolic um, win on this allows him to say look uh, I made the hard choice of, of dumping a guy um, and so I think symbolically it's very important for him. I still think there's a bigger reckoning with the language of the politics of grievance and how inculcated that's become into the conservative message. So we'll leave that for uh, another day. I went over it last week. But when I say is this over now, I just mean this particular little episode. Like because I, I hear I hear Sloan saying, "Well, hang on a second. This guy bought a party membership. This neo-Nazi guy." And I don't I don't know much about that world, obviously, and I don't know who the guy is, Paul Fromm, Frederick Fromm, whatever the hell. But he says he was allowed to participate in the leadership. People knew who he was. That kind of is. So is that all just going out the door, screaming over his shoulder, or is that like an issue? I'm not that interested in Sloan, and I'm not that interested in where this Sloan issue goes. I, and I, I mean, you know, well, that's why if, I raised that because that would be a bigger. Comment. If his accusation is that O'Toole and the Conservatives are in are in bed with the Nazis, I'm not prepared to accept that allegation. Um, <laughs> okay, I buy that. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think that's true. But doesn't this Sloan thing have to be seen as a piece with the statement that O'Toole put out the day before, uh, addressing extreme elements and talking about the moderation of the Conservative Party he wanted to lead, giving examples of how of the moderation of the Conservative Party he wanted to lead. I mean, it's even possible they set they set Sloan up as a one-two piece. Um, people say that, eh? To, people say that. To make the point. This was a, like, Sloan says that. Sloan says this is a setup. Other people have speculated, you know, just a little too cute. He puts a statement out, and then the next day, they just happen to find this. I don't know. That feels, that, well, that, listen, that feels a little made for TV for me, but maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm uh, naive. Who, 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 who knows? Uh, uh, listen, I actually don't even know what Aaron's statement really meant. I have been part of the conservative movement for over 20 years now, and I don't. Uh, what is the far right? What is the definition of the far right? Because I don't know what it is. Well, what you set you your sextant for the right, and then you get there, and then you go just a, a bit more. Uh, so that's. And there's a big placard that says far right. And uh, no, I'm being. I'm being actually. Honest. I know. What do you think I, he I, means? I, I, what I, what I, do you think he means, means Jenny? I, what I do you think he I, means? I, I don't know. Um, I, d- I don't know. I'm asking you. I actually don't know what it means. I know that uh, I, you would think that uh, the conservative movement, uh, I, you know, was nowhere in this country. Let's not forget for the last out of the last 16 years, 10 years of, of that has been governed by a conservative government, has been governed by Stephen Harper, who had a very broad and vast coalition, one that Aaron O'Toole was elected to halfway through. And so when I am reading that statement and I've talked to people uh, who feel the exact same way that I do, we don't actually even understand what it means. We don't understand who it was uh, uh, directed to. Um, But what it makes it seem is that prior to Aaron O'Toole, there was no credible conservative uh, 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 movement within the country, within the, within our party. And that's just false. Hmm. Well, I enjoy listening to you bust his balls about that, but um, I assume it's a term of art in that he deliberately doesn't want to define it, and he doesn't want to define it for all the reasons I articulated last week, because it's easy to say, okay, we're not down. Let's not go back, let's not go back to next week. My, my dad couldn't even stomach through our, our podcast. For well, I'm week. sorry you guys didn't like it, but I feel strongly about the issue. Like, I think, you know, this politics of grievance issue is a problem. So you can, you can say, well, we're not going to truck and trade with uh, neo-Nazis and now Derek Sloan, because he does. Um, but where are you with, um, where are you at for the party when it comes to saying, well, we're comfortable with 
uh, accrediting um, Ezra Levant and Rebel. You know, is that far right or not far right? Many people would say it is far right. If it isn't far right, then you got a problem. So he's going to get pushed on this, just not by people like yourself or in the Conservative Party who go, well, I'm not sure what you're getting at, but he's going to get um, pushed on it by others who are going to say, But how is, okay, so go back, go back to what you said. Go back to what you said. When have neo-Nazis been involved in any form of the Conservative Party? They gave, they gave like some guy gave $131 uh, uh, to I, some lunatic that's what I'm candidate saying. That, was, that was running. That's, I'm saying that's easy. That's, a, that's an easy, he can dunk on the eight-foot rim on that, saying we're not going to have neo-Nazis. But where's he stand? Like, is the far right, is the rebel the far right? Because lots of people in the party have dealt with the rebel, been lots of commingling. Or is it now deemed to be not not acceptable because of its association with the Proud Boys and Gavin McGee? Deemed by uh, who, Menzies? Scott? Like, deemed, by, huh? deemed by who? Deemed well, I by guess who? O'Toole, like, isn't it? Like, wouldn't the, wouldn't, the, wouldn't the national media push the conservative party on these issues until it was the liberal party? Well... Okay. Like, do they have to listen to the national media consensus about these things? No, they don't. But they may, they're going to get pushed around. I mean, the issue okay, but now what is, is that, okay, you keep, okay, you guys always talk about, okay, so you, you, you wanted to go back to what, what is the definition of a far right? What does that mean? When you say Aaron, o Aaron O'Toole is disavowing himself from the far right, I am asking a genuine question to you guys. What does that mean? Well, I'm saying that it's not, I, I don't know. I can't define it. I can give you a well, definition you that would be, you well, talk, hang on. You talk about it. Well, okay, let me finish. My definition, I, I can come back to it. I can, I can give you my definition in a second. The question really is, since he's embraced the term, what's his definition of it, right? So does it include the rebel? For me, if you're going to say, I'm not going to have any truck and trade with the far right, the way I would define that is uh, those that are associated with the Proud Boys, that are associated with um, uh, with the, the the chronic and deliberate for-profit uh, peddling of misinformation and conspiracy theories and and leading into violence. So I would say I have no truck and trade with Rebel or anybody who's been associated. I'd have no truck and trade with Proud Boys. I'd have no truck and trade with that movement. I would not necessarily think that that extends to those who are pro-life or Christian evangelicals. I don't think you would necessarily define those as alt-right. Um, that's a social conservative issue and you have to navigate that based on your own values. But I think what's a, an easy place to start with for someone who isn't Aaron O'Toole is rebel and that those folks in that orbit. And I don't think that he can go there. I don't, I think when your point, it starts to break down his assertion that he will have nothing to do with the far right. The second you get past neo-Nazis, because once you get into the rebel, then how do you defend that? Well, they haven't like if really his had definition of the far do right them. doesn't, really doesn't include anything. rebel... Well, okay, Scott, doesn't it, doesn't it matter what he says on the rebel? Like, if the rebel has an audience of people that are alienated from the political system, I'm not against people talking to them. It depends on what he says to them. If he goes on the rebel and panders to the rebel audience, that's an issue. If he goes on the rebel and tells I people don't agree. the truth. No? I got a different Why view. Not? I think the rebel is a platform. I, don't, I think the rebel presents itself as a news organization. I think to knowingly say, I'm going to validate the lie that it's a news organization, as opposed to a for-profit machine that exists to generate and whip up uh, dollars and grievance. Um, I'm going to say, sorry, I'm not going to participate in uh, legitimizing it by doing interviews with it. I'm not going to participate in the effort by saying that I think that it ought to be recognized by press galleries at the federal and provincial level. So, um, you know, that's my definition. People can come at me. That's my definition. The question is, if it's going to sustain and mean anything, what's his definition of the far right? And so as an easy example and question that if I were a reporter, I could put to him would be, so does that mean that you're changing your perspective on rebel as an example? And I'm not, and, and I found like I'm pounding and pounding on them, but there could be other markers, but it's all your question, Jenny, right? It's the same thing as what you're asking, which is, no, so what I'm, are the I'm, boundaries of that? Well, but I'm asking because everyone keeps talking about the far right. And as I said, I've been involved in the conservative movement for uh, uh, close to 25 years of my life. And I am asking everyone that keeps talking about it, what does that mean? Because am well, I got part no of problem it? giving you a definition. I just did. What does Ken, what is Ken, what is okay, Ken Bozicool say? To, say to, what does Ken Bozicool well, say to that? Because he wrote Ken that is, article Ken is saying just, that. Ken is just falling yeah. all over himself to be liberal and to be liked by the liberal establishment. And I say that as a friend. I'm I'm a friend of Ken's, but um, the that 
um, I am sick of conservatives who like fall all over themselves to like be liked by the liberals. I've been falling all over myself to be liked by the liberal establishment for 40 years and it's still not working. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck, Ken. Um, Jenny, so this is a, you know, I mean, this is a long standing challenge for the conservative party, the way these things get covered. I mean, Someday I would like you to tell me what happened to Randy White after the 2004 election. Um, what kind of conversations were had with him after the 2004 election? Because uh, that was certainly helpful. But Trudeau, here's, here's the thing I'm interested in. Trudeau took an action that one may agree or disagree with in saying that to be a candidate, you had to say that you were pro, pro-choice. You could not be pro-life and say you're going to vote pro-life and be a, a candidate for the Liberal Party. Is there any similar conceptual type of litmus test that it would be helpful for the Conservatives to apply to candidates to try to take this issue off the table? Like what? Well, I can. I, I think we could ask candidates uh, if they've ever dressed in blackface, and my guess is every single Conservative MP has not. Right. Okay. Right. So I'm, I'm is thinking. Your position, I'm thinking of Jenny, something. So my example to back. To, my example back to you would be, uh, say, conversion therapy. Something Sloan's very keen on, um, which appears to be something that most Canadians think is retrograde. Um, Agreed. So things things like that. If you could say, listen, you know, we're not for that. And if you're for that, you're not going to be sitting in our caucus advocating that because we're not for that. Would there be any? Any? I mean. I just, I'm just trying to think from the conservative perspective, how do you stop getting hammered by the marginal elements of your caucus all the time? Well, Derek Sloan is like, Derek Sloan is one guy. I, I'm not sure we have, we have a caucus of 120 people now, uh, it was 121 up until this morning or last night or whenever the vote is going to be. I'm not sure why an entire movement is being framed by one uh, one backbench MP who no one has heard of. It, it, it makes no sense to me that it was a mistake he ran in the first place. Like, why is an entire movement being why is why are why is an entire movement being based on that? As I said, like, what do you mean the problems we've had, David? We were we were in government for we like we were in government for close to a decade from right. from two thousand and February from January twenty third, uh, two thousand and six. Uh, to October, whatever it was, uh, 2015, we were in government. The Conservative Party of Canada, Stephen Harper got elected three times. Yeah, and, well, and you Jeffrey know Simpson wrote a book called, Rick Jeffrey Simpson wrote a book called The Discipline of Power. And I presume that you were heavily involved in keeping your caucus disciplined and on message and not straying into a lot of those territories. Um, and I mean, I presume you worked at that because you knew that there was that potential there. Well, and, but Stephen Harper had the respect of, of caucus. What do you mean? I, I don't understand what you mean by the potential. The potential for what? Potential for people to pop up and say something that gets captured by uh, central Canadian media and magnified, like, like Randy White did or like Derek Sloan has. And, and how the liberals, case. you guys, Paul Martin's uh, big supporters, the SoCon caucus, the rump from uh, Ontario, the John O'Reilly's and the... Uh, Tom Lapel's, just like you guys had to do. Yeah, we did. We yeah. did, right? But um, Trudeau in part dealt. Trudeau in part dealt with that. Yeah. Well, no, the, they all lost their seats. It was it was dealt with. Well, yeah, it was no. dealt with by the electorate. That is but true. The, the difference. The, that is true. I mean, the difference between what Trudeau has done and what O'Toole has done, I think, is interesting. Um, and what Trudeau did, and it wasn't. Uh, received um, with uniform applause within the party or outside of the party. What he said was, this is a litmus test. You, 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 you got to be pro-choice. And to your point, Jenny, it uh, did disqualify a bunch of people and it would have disqualified in the past, looking forward, a bunch of people. Um, well, but it's a to, specific to, test. Let me, just let me finish. It's, it's, a, okay. it's a specific test. I think what's interesting about what O'Toole has done and maybe it's not just a term of art, maybe it's a real problem for him now that I think more about it listening to you, um, 
is that that's not his, the far right, we're not going to have anything to do with the far right, but it being an undefined term might become problematic for him because you're saying, well, I'm in the conservative movement and I'm pissed by that because I don't know what it is and what it isn't. It doesn't have the same tangibility and litmus test um, potency as does the Trudeau thing, whether you like it or not. And so you're going to end up in a situation where, you know, he's going to be asked in the future, since you said that as a matter of values and principle, you won't truck with the far right. But we have this example of a senior member of your caucus doing an interview with a uh, rebel, or we have this example of somebody saying they're in favor of conversion therapy to use David's example. There are 10 other examples. Some might be social conservative issues. They might be about, you know, propagating um, misinformation. It might be Roman Barber in Ontario saying, you know, I don't buy any of this lockdown stuff. I don't buy any of uh, any of these public health measures. What's he going to define as the far right? And since it isn't as tangible as your pro-choice or not, it does that become... Does that give him a helpful amount of political latitude to navigate and make arbitrary judgments? Or does it create a box for him where he's going to be in a constant set of contradictions and asked about every single thing? And I think maybe it, now that I think about it, it's going to be more problematic um, uh, than, uh, than what Trudeau did. Um, because it means that probably people are going to be saying, I'm holding the measuring tape up and I, I don't know what it but, is. But Trudeau, but Trudeau didn't tell people they had to be, be pro-choice. He just said they had to support... He, they had to support pro-choice. Cho they had to be publicly pro-choice. Yeah, he sure. Himself, he himself is on the record as being pro-life. It literally, literally his, his, his Trudeau's comments are almost mirror what Andrew Scheer said. If you stood up and said, I don't think it's a good idea. I, th I think that we should remove a woman's right to choose. You'd be kicked out of caucus. Um, if somebody stands up to, tomorrow and says, I'm in favor of conversion therapy, it's not clear whether that fits into no, but I guess, Aaron's but this definition is what I'm, but of the far right. Is, okay, but this is what I'm, I'm trying to say, and I hate talking about, like, I don't even know why we're going down this, this, like, this issue, but Justin Trudeau said, I am personally pro-life, but I will not legislate on abortion. It was almost word for word, because I did right. panel after panel during the 2019 campaign. So trust me, I'm, I, I remember reading about it. And he, it, it is literally almost the same. There is a difference between, say, what one's personal uh, belief is uh, and what they would legislate on. I, don't, I have not talked to any conservative ever that has ever supported conversion therapy. I, and I don't, if that's Derek Sloan's like bailiwick, this is why he never should have been allowed to run in the party. I personally have never spoke to one conservative that supports that ever. Okay, hey, can I ask you guys this thing, this question? Given what we've learned about politics from Trump, should O'Toole have even bothered to deal with this? Like, so the the the, the whole Trump thing happens down in the states, and there's a big liberal social media effort to link the conservatives to Trumpism, and the media are helping and aiding in that effort. So it feels in the crucible. Like, you've got to do something. We've got to relieve the pressure. We've got to do something to feed the media beast on this, or they'll keep hounding us. Or is the lesson from Trump that if they just ignored it, next week it would be gone, and we'd be talking. I mean, the last two weeks ago we were talking about ministers who travel, and now we're talking about this, and next week we'd be talking about something else, and it would be, and it would be gone. Um, is that the new lesson of politics, or do you still need to address these things? Fix them. I'm not sure anything sticks anymore. Well, I can't answer for Aaron O'Toole, but I'll tell you, this is something I think about a lot uh, from a professional standpoint. I don't think it's a question about politics. I think it's a question about issues management and that applies to politics, but it applies to every other dimension of issues management because the media and public attention has shifted so greatly in the last 15 years. I mean, my truck and trade on issues management, crisis management, you know, there's a very standard playbook for years and years, right? You say, go to the what the, go to the end. How bad is it going to get? Then work your way backward and make the decisions today, even the ones you're reluctant to, that avoid that very worst outcome. Um, and you are always in a fight about, oh, am I bargaining against myself if I say this thing too early or make this action too early or not? So you have that fight. That's been the playbook forever. There is a compelling argument in light of what we witnessed for four years with Trump, which is that you can set a bonfire a day and they all, it isn't that they burn out, it's that people just quit, quit paying attention to the bonfire, um, that you no longer have to 
shit your pants if your no news organization is the subject of the headline story in the Toronto Star and it's Star gets action and it's a terrible scandal story. And then you go, okay, well, what are we going to do and all this sort of stuff? I mean, there's a school of thought that says in 90% of those cases, you could just go, uh, you know what? Uh, go out back, have a cigarette, wait until tomorrow, and then the headline will be something else. And by the way, you'll be astonished at how few people n notice that headline because we no longer work in a world where if it was on CBC last night, if it's in the Toronto Star tomorrow, then that's the biggest news story in the world and everybody's conscious of it. So I think it's, I think it's a valid question for Aaron O'Toole um, from a media management, from an issues management standpoint, from a definition standpoint, and this is where obviously Jenny and I don't agree, I, I think... I think this whole politics of grievance issue, um, I think about, you know, w w w trying to define what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in the coalition. These are always problems for brokerage parties. Um, and I think they're a particular problem right now for the conservatives. And I think the evidence that it must be a problem for the conservatives isn't Derek Sloan. It's that Aaron O'Toole had to put that statement out two days ago. He felt that he had to put out that statement. That tells you that they feel that there's some kind of chorus that they feel they must respond to. All right. Well, in talking about the biggest issue uh, in the world right now, it's actually vaccines. And so uh, as, as Aaron O'Toole has now spent three days talking about Derek Sloan and uh, uh, trying to define certain members of, uh, of his own party, uh, we continue to be 1.4% uh, of Canadians have been vaccinated per capita. We are behind uh, the UK. We are behind Italy. We're behind Ireland in terms of uh, in terms of uh, vac vaccinations. And part of that, it's not just uh, it's not just the uh, provinces. It's the uh, it, what we've seen now. It's going to be even more uh, acute because, uh, of course, 50% of our supply is going to be cut off because of problems uh, in terms of the European production of Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine, and so. Um, that, I believe, is what the vast majority of Canadians who are captivated and, and, and the only thing that they care about is in terms of getting on with some form of uh, normalcy uh, with in terms of uh, in terms of COVID uh, and, and living with it. Uh, I, I would actually rather hear political parties uh, talk about that. Uh, I, you know, uh, Biden's decision on Keystone, that's a pretty big deal for at West. It was a priority that Justin Trudeau said was one of his priorities. And 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 Biden is now uh, Biden is now scrapping that. So there are actually issues that I believe political parties should be addressing uh, that actually touch on and 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 affect Canadians. Well, let's move. Let's move to Keystone. Let's move to Keystone because it is a big deal. And, you know, um, uh, and then we can talk vaccines as well. OK, people. Uh, People suspected people who don't support Trump, at least, suspected that Biden might be good for the world and therefore good for Canada and good for the United States, but perhaps bad for Canada's economic interests. And we've seen the first evidence of that, and he isn't even in office yet, with his decision to cancel the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, is there anything that the anybody, Trudeau, anybody could have done about this, or is this just a was always going to be a fact of life. Well, I, I, th I think they, I think absolutely, like I think there's absolutely they could have been engaged, uh, uh, been engaged with uh, uh, with Biden once the uh, um, once the uh, election was was uh, uh, was clear, which was in in November. I think that probably uh, Trump and Giuliani were the only people that thought that like there was any a glimmer of hope that. Uh, that he was going to end up, uh, that he was going to end up winning. But I think we've, I think Canadians for for Keystone. I think that uh, in terms of the two Michaels in China, there's a lot of people that are putting a lot of uh, hope that uh, uh, of Trudeau's relationship uh, with the Americans. And we forget that regardless of whether it's a Republican, a Democrat, who it is, they're going to make decisions based on what's in their best interest, not necessarily what's in the best interest, uh, uh, what's in the next best interest for us. And I think, David, you and I talked about it on CBC last week. I think that's going to be the next, uh, that is going to be the next um, uh, issue that I think is going to come up between the two countries, because I think there's a lot of people that are assuming that Biden is going to um, uh, take up, uh, uh, take up our case uh, in terms of dealing with the, with the, uh, with the Chinese regime. And, and uh, I don't think it's, it's 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 crystal, it's clear that that's actually that that's going to happen in terms of uh, in terms of negotiating to get the two Michaels home. Um, 
I, th I think this is a huge uh, challenge for Trudeau. And I think that the, um, I don't think that the challenge is trying to overturn the decision because I think that that's an inevitability. But I think the challenge is um, to avoid, uh, there's an op-ed today by Jim Stanford, who I like a lot. Um, he's an admittedly, he's a self-acknowledged, you know, sort of left to center economist. His, his op-ed today basically is like, those jobs aren't coming back, that industry ain't coming back. And it might as well have been titled, fuck it, it's gone. And I think it's really, really, really important um, for Trudeau um, to not betray that instinct. Um, I don't think that he can um, run the risk of uh, treating this like it's a regional issue or it's a sectoral issue. It's got to be a national issue. And, and I, I really, um, we've talked about this before. We talked about this in the aftermath of the election and COVID overwhelmed everything. But, you know, I, I think... You know, first, if I was Trudeau, I think he, I think he needs to do three things. First, I think he needs to uh, fight it and be seen to be fighting it with some energy. And he'll probably lose and almost inevitably will lose. But I think he should try to fight it because I think he wants to be seen as saying, no, look, we've all put some chips on the table on this thing. And this is a matter of national interest for Canada. And I'd really like you to change your mind. And I think it's just as important that he's seen to be having that fight, even if it's hopeless. Second, don't brass ring it. You know, I, I really worry that people go, okay, so what's going to happen in the energy industry? Well, you know what? We've got a brand new thing. We're going to like, there's this box. It's called uh, the hydrogen solution. We're going to build the biggest hydrogen energy solution in the world. We're going to be it. And, and and I worry about that. Like, I just worry it's kind of like, you know what? We're going to be like skyhooks. The world needs skyhooks. We're going to invent skyhooks. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's a fanciful hope, the hydrogen industry. I hope that it does turn out. But I, 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 I hope the... The wrong thing to do is to try to replace it with um, we're going to put all our bets on one um, on one spot. And and the final thing is, I think you got to I think you got to really get back to the hard work of saying, even in the context of a massive economic recovery as a consequence of COVID, even in the context of the public health challenge that's happening, we have a national imperative. It's not a regional imperative. We have a national imperative um, to deal with the transition the energy industry is going to go through here in Canada. And we're going to treat it as a national imperative. And we're going to do transition programs in much the same way we did. And I mean, Paul used this example, like much the same way we did with Newfoundland, with the cod stocks. Like we're going to see what is the sustaining aspect of that industry and what we can do to make certain that, you know, uh, oil and gas and we're sustaining those jobs in industry where it is for as long as possible. And also uh, um, exploiting every new opportunity in the energy industry going forward, not just one big hope. Um, and I just think, and that means we're like really in-depth, disproportionate support for those workers and for those industries. And yes, you're going to provoke a lot of jealousies and people are going to say, well, what about this industry? And what about this in Quebec? And what about that in Ontario? I think they should do it as a matter of national imperative. Um, uh, and I think the wrongest thing to do would be to say, guys, this is the way of the world. Biden's telling us that fossil fuels are over and we just have to give up the ghost on it. I don't think we can afford to do that. And I think it's a big opportunity for the federal government to show to Alberta and Saskatchewan, um, we're going to stand with you through this transition and not just make it like symbolic and rhetoric and words. So, Jenny, in 2014 or 2015, before he was prime minister, Justin Trudeau went out to Calgary. I don't know whether he spoke to the Chamber of Commerce or the Petroleum Club or whatever. But he said something to the following. He said that no country that found the oil and gas below the ground that we have would leave that in the ground. So he committed to developing their asset. And his grand bargain was, we're going to have an aggressive climate policy at home that meets our international targets that features a carbon price. And the exchange for that is we're going to develop the hell out of our oil until people are no longer buying oil. We're going to make sure that Canadian oil is maximized during that period of time. Is that the policy of the government of Canada? No, I don't think so. No. Nope. It's that last point, David. Until that transition is complete, we're going to try to wring every bit of economic benefit out of the uh, out of the sector. That's the point I was trying to make a moment ago. You can't just walk away from it and say, "Well, it's thirty years from now. We just might as well pretend it's happened." Right. Right. Any idea what they ought to do now? 
Or are they, we just uh, hoovered? Well, okay. Uh, Jenny, I want to get off right. the inauguration right. and the transfer. Of, well, go ahead. Go ahead. You got something to say? No, I was just going to say, I thought it's... Well, I don't know. I tried to lay out a plan. Like I think it's. I. I, th I think you really have to. It's not just transition. You also have to see what aspects. What's marketable out there. Um, the world's still going to use. You made this point to me yesterday, Jenny. The world's still going to use fossil fuels. The question is whether they're going to use Canada's. So if we can't get Keystone built, and if we're going to have a two market problem, what is gen what's practically available to us as options? In, in a world where it's going to be increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to get those projects uh, made. So what's available? And I think you say, that's the circle here within the oil and gas industry, and we're going to do everything we can to support and advantage that so that we make as much uh, economic return on that as possible. At the same time, you support workers through transition, and you try to develop not one strategy on hydrogen, but multiple strategies in terms of an energy future. So let us let's, let's let me put one idea on the table, which is that... Uh Instead of blaming the Americans for not building a pipeline for us, we could build our own pipeline. Should we put Energy East back on the table? Yeah, I don't think it should, ever should have been taken off the table. But I don't think mm -hmm. I see no. I see zero evidence that 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 this that this government will move towards that. I, I agree. I, agree. I see zero evidence. But is that what ought is that what ought to happen? Well, and it, it ought uh, not to have been taken off the table in the first place. But like he's got like like you, you know Gibo is the what the heritage minister, but from every report that you hear internally, he 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 internally really seems to be the environment minister. And so when you have uh, when you have voices like that that seem to be uh, leading the charge in terms of uh, natural resources policy, I don't think there's any I, I don't think there's any way that they can. It, it will be like Scott to your to your to your point. Like a lot of what you're suggesting, and I'm not even disagreeing with all of it, but a lot of what you're suggesting is just rhetoric. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, placating uh, people in the oil and gas sector. So yes, but I don't think this government, do you see any evidence this government is going to entertain that? No, but I don't see any evidence that any government, even a conservative government would entertain it because I've not heard a conservative yet, and certainly not Aaron O'Toole, say that they would impose Energy East on an opposing Quebec government. That's the issue. And so that is the that is the fundamental question. Do you have a federal government that will say to Quebec, we know you don't want it and we don't care, we're going to build it anyway? Um, and I haven't heard anybody say that. No one will. And that's that's the fundamental okay. the problem isn't just it isn't Stephen Guibo. It's that Stephen Guibo is smack dab in the center of contemporary opinion in the province of Quebec. And so to do it, you would have to do it in defiance of popular opinion. You'd have to do it in the defiance of sharp political opposition. Um, and you would lose seats or not gain seats, depending upon where you're starting. Yeah. From. Yeah. I've seen evidence. Uh, I've seen evidence that Quebecers or Ontarians, for that matter, have zero idea how much oil is moving by rail through their province. How many potential lac megantics there are every day. That's the best argument in Quebec. This is my it. cynical view on being in government often, which is, pipe. you know, governments always want to rush to the microphone and tell you what they're doing. My view is there's lots of times when you do things and you don't need to, like, shine a blazing light on yourself. But you're not going to get energy ease through without, you know, fighting it uphill. Right. Hey, Jenny, you said you want to talk about vaccines. What do you want to talk about? Well, I don't think I, I, I think that it remains. I, I am I am uh, I am shocked uh, that the cover that uh, uh, the provinces continue to give uh, to give the federal federal government in terms of the procurement of, uh, of vaccines. They the 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 feds continue to say that we're all going to be vaccinated by September. And it just is uh, it is it is not possible based on the rate that we're getting vaccines and based on the rate that they're actually being uh, they're being administered to people. So. Um, I think as more and more, like, you know, uh, close to 30% of Israelis have been vaccinated, you're getting up to close to 7% of uh, the UK, 5% of, of the US. And I think as more and more uh, countries around us that we watch uh, get vaccinated, it's going to become, um, uh, I, I think it's going to become an increasingly political issue uh, for, uh, for the federal government. And it just shocks me that 
it not it is not something that uh, seemingly any opposition party, uh, either the Conservatives or the NDP or anyone, seem to be talking about, and the provinces uh, just seem to be providing cover on uh, on the feds. Really? Do you think? Because I feel like um, I, I feel like th- this. I mean, it moves so constantly back and forth. It feels like to me like the balls bounced firmly back into the court of the feds. Um, and that, uh, that if, they, if, if the, the objective of the provinces was to take the, uh, to, to take the heat on themselves, I think they've done a poor job. I think the heat's been moving back to the feds in the last full day, few days. It, I, I, I continue to struggle with this. You would think since it's the most important issue in the country, that any logical person who's ever worked in politics would say, therefore, this has got to get done in a more satisfactory way, or it's going to inflame your government but as i kind of hinted at last week and it goes to your point david that we were talking about earlier in terms of issues management i i'm starting to think that both for the provinces and for the feds the feds on supply the provinces on rollout it kind of feels like the news on this moves around so much new supply pfizer's withholding supply this thing's coming out that's that that i'm just starting to question it's all uh, whether whether any government is really going to pay like a heavy duty political price for this. It, it feels like, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like people are holding government's account. Now scroll forward three weeks after three more weeks of winter lockdown, three more weeks. If it's say it's a steady diet of three weeks of news saying, we're just not going to really get started in Canada until April. Maybe that completely overwhelms the feds. So well, I'm not starting- disputing the point. I'm just I, I'm I'm starting to really question whether my assumption about the laws of political gravity are applying here. It feels like they're not paying the penalty for it. But we're start so we're starting to see incumbent government incumbent incumbent governments in terms of polling uh, start to take a hit. There was an abacus poll out right. this morning that has uh, 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 Doug Ford's government at 34 percent, the Liberals at 29 percent. That's the closest. Um, that is the closest that these parties have been since the pandemic started. If you remember, uh, Doug, uh, D- I believe they were in the 20, mid-20s when the pandemic started. The pandemic happened and, and his popularity and the government's popularity skyrocketed. So we're starting to see more of an even. Mark, I haven't as- seen I haven't seen 29% next to the Liberals since the city TV debate the week before the provincial election. <laughs> so I just think you're starting to see a, I, as, as people... Um, uh, I think uh, it, it's becoming uh, more and more. Scott, to your point, it's 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 winter. We're getting into the uh, close to a year of of doing that. People's awareness and people's understanding of COVID and the aspects around it are a lot uh, more pronounced uh, and known than what they were um, for the first few months of uh, for the few first few months of the pandemic. So I think that some of the the tricks that governments uh, of all um, uh, of all stripes have been, have played for the first bit. They're just not uh, uh, they're not working anymore. I think I think poli- I think that you know we've got stay at home orders in two of the biggest provinces, but yet politicians go out every day in those two provinces and and have events. So it's kind of like okay, you're telling us to stay at home, but your press conferences, uh, uh, Doug, John Tory, uh, Francois Legault, you guys, th- these are all essential. You can't do this like everyone else is doing from their. Uh, from their living room and do it uh, via Zoom or what have you. And so I think people's patience is, are starting to wear very thin with uh, public officials. So let me, let me put it to you in this context, both of you. So you are the liberal government. In your ideal scenario, and I'm making this up, right? I'm not speaking on their behalf, but I, in your ideal scenario, you're going to have a March budget and a May election, April or May election, in that, in your ideal scenario, where do you need to be by March or April on vaccines? What situation do you absolutely have to be in? Well, you need, and I would say rough, I would say rough parity with the United, I would say rough parity with the United States. Rough parity with the United States. You're going to have, you want people to, uh, uh, you want people to believe that uh, uh, they are going to get the vaccine within the next three months. And and right now, I don't think that that is doable, but we've seen people are willing to, this is something people, this is the hope to get out of the, you know, the this lockdown, this COVID prison that people are living in. So 
everybody wants to believe when governments say we're going to have you vaccinated by June or July or September, uh, even though if logically it's not true. So if if there can still be some hope on the horizon um, for uh, for the federal liberal government, you're going to want to go before that hope is kind of or before, you know, you see hundreds of millions of people uh, in the states uh, uh, vaccinated. And, you know, we're not even uh, we're not even close. Like. I, 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 we talked about it last week. Like, I actually think the liberal, uh, the the conservatives, they talked about it one day, and 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 some some people on Twitter jumped on Aaron O'Toole for talking about prisoners being vaccinated before uh, people in long-term care facilities or or frontline workers. I think that was, I think that was actually a very good issue for them. I, I don't know why they they stopped on that uh, because it's something I spoke with members of my of my family who are more predisposed to vote for. Uh, for the liberals and vote for uh, the conservatives, and they were outraged by that. So I think there's issues like that. that yeah, well, you know, the that, policy elites frowned on that, Jenny. The policy elites. Frowned I know, on and that. Andrew Andrew Coyne was 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 uh, was very much against Aaron's position on that. Well, so was Jason <laughs> Kenney, that um, also uh, well recognized policy um, elite. Um, yeah. Um, remember two thousand, David. Um, in the fall of 2000, we brought in a, an economic statement that was really one of the largest budgets in history, brought in the largest personal income tax cut at that point in history. That's yeah, um, our worst budget by a mile. And, uh, and, and boom, uh, <laughs> we called an election off of it. And, okay. and it, that moment managed to hit the sweet spot between... Um, gathering up all of the optimism and confidence that had been uh, husbanded because of balanced budget with the optimism that it was going to be, uh, there was going to be a big dividend. And now it was, now we've gone through this, we've gotten the budget balance, there's a euphoric sense of a national achievement. Then there's like, not only that, but I'm going to get a personal uh, dividend from it. And bang, uh, it was the perfect timing. And yes, it was an early election and Christian got some criticism, but it worked out. You look at that and you kind of go, where, like, if you're hoping to ride a surf of optimism about vaccines where people feel like the world's opening up, I can go back out there, I'm, and I'm going to, and I'm going to apply that optimism uh, in the form of a vote to the incumbent government at the federal level. If you, so do you go in the spring, as you said, or, or later, I, like, I think I'm defying your construct, but I, I don't, I think what, and you look at it from that perspective, I think, and the things that Jenny said, I think that's why you can't have a spring election. I, I think it's too risky. I just don't think we know. We may not have enough built up optimism. It may be that we're in a situation where too many Americans have been vaccinated, not enough of Canadians, and the optimism isn't starting to work its way through, and the economy isn't opening up enough, and that's not the sweet spot. And that instead, the sweet spot is you bring in a September budget, you have vaccinated a critical mass of people in the summer, whatever leg there may have been between the Americans and the Canadians now feels like it's sort of washed away and you try to uh, bring in a budget that's more forward looking about economic recovery, captures people's sense of uh, uh, opening up and optimism and you go then. I think that would be the bet I would make in default planning and I grant you that you've probably got to double track if you're the feds, but I don't, I know everyone talks about, oh, spring election, spring election. I'm just telling you my, personally, my spidey sense is tingling that it would be too dangerous. But but sometimes the unknown is worse than the than than where you're the present. So um, I, I the economic and, and we've talked about this, the economic uh, ramifications of COVID have not fully been hit yet. And we're starting to see it uh, in terms of inflation, uh, in terms of food prices, food prices in, in terms of produce, uh, especially have are, are uh, increasing uh, dramatically for people during uh, the course of the winter. And it's only. A matter of time before it, 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 it the ramifications are, are going to be felt uh, uh, far, far. I think they're going to. It's going to be. It's going to be felt further. And so, yep. if I'm the government now, that is the f calculus that I'm doing. Is if we wait another six months, if we wait another eight months, uh, people's financial uh, security could be uh, tested where it has not actually, for the most part, uh, for the most part, uh, other than the poor small businesses. Uh, uh, especially here in Ontario, that have been that have just been brutalized. Um, uh, people haven't felt it the way that uh, I think they're going to. 
But I, again, that's and Jenny to that to point. Jenny to that point. To well, maybe, maybe to that to that point. There's a lot of talk about a K-shaped economy or a K-shaped recovery, and the evidence is out of the economy so far that I understand is that affluent white collar workers have actually not been negatively economically affected by the recession in large measure. They've kept their jobs. They were able to work from home. Their yeah. incomes have been steady. They've been inconvenienced by this. But people who work in the service sector, in retail or anything like that, who tend to be women, who tend to be lower income, have been absolutely devastated by this. And there isn't an obvious route back into the economy for a lot of those people. That's the liberal voting base. That's the liberal voting base, right? They've got to be concerned about that. That the you know those people are going to be sitting there in the fall unemployed with not great prospects. And the and, and thing Trudeau is over. and Trudeau himself has said the government programs aren't going to last forever. He's 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 put that out there in the last couple months. Uh the last couple months as well. And that, I get nobody that, wants to be on CERB forever anyway. I I, I really it just takes me to the fall. Like, I think if you're trying to, to, all the considerations you're talking about, if you're trying to guesstimate when the the greatest amount of economic optimism is, I think it's when vaccinations have started to hit. People see the American economy starting to come back. You can bring in a budget that says, we're going to have 6.5% growth this coming year. This many more people are going to be hired. People want to cash in on the on the hope that things are going to get better. So those that aren't doing as well think this is going to be my moment. Those that are doing well say, hey, this is great. We're getting back on track. And you've got uh, needles in people's arms at that point. So they are feeling it. Like, I think that's the the meeting place of public health and economic optimism uh, by my vote. But I'm not, you know, these things are judgment calls. And it's 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 why it's 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 super risky. Nothing lends itself to counterfactuals more like the prospect of calling an election because yeah. there's a million different scenarios you could game out about how things could go. Ultimately, the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is their gut on those things, right? It's their decision. I just think by the end of the summer, um, the only bad news we're going to have is Kim and Kanye not going to marriage counseling. And I think that that's probably the kind of time to drop the writ, you know? <laughs> Hey, Jenny, can I, before we wrap up, can I ask you a specific question? Sure. Which is the government's, you, you worked through a change of administration in Washington from one party to another. Yeah. And obviously one president to another. Um, what kinds of things, is there a playbook for what you do in that circumstance? Like, are there, how do you, how do you try to get your mitts into that new administration? Are there high level meetings going on between ministers and and their potential counterparts? Are you reaching out to your counterparts as staff people? What's going on? Yeah, so there is there was there was all of that happening and I'm and I assume that it's happening now uh, between the two levels of government. It's uh, uh, staff to staff, uh, uh, official to official uh, at, you know, Obama's first meeting uh, after he took office was uh, was to Canada. It was in February of uh, um, February after he was uh, after he was elected, two thousand and nine, um, and so I, I, those are all things that's. I, I know it's a bit different in the in the COVID uh, the COVID area, but I think other than probably planning the first uh, the first official face to face meeting, I, I assume that everything that uh, everything this government is doing uh, uh, is you know. Uh, th th you know they've been through they've been through a change and this will be their second uh, dealing with a change of power uh, in terms of uh, an American administration. Um, Jen O'Malley Dillon, who's uh, Biden's deputy chief of staff, obviously has really strong links with the government in terms of she worked on the 2015, 2015 campaign. She knows Katie Telford extremely well. She probably knows the prime minister. How much of an advantage is that? Well, it's I think it's an advantage. It's it's what be it the U.S. and be it like the the PMO and the uh, and the White House. Uh, we know how much it is to ha what advantage it is to have relationships in different offices in in what we've done in politics before. So of course, when you have a personal connection, a personal relationship, it it uh, it is always uh, it's always helpful. All right, hey, let's do some hey yous. Who wants to go first? Not me. 
Scott, you get to go first. All right. Uh, okay. My hey you is to Blanchette, uh, leader of the Bloc Québécois, who's been going on a bit of a tear against uh, uh, our friend Omar there, the new transport minister. And I, I just, my, my hey you is, I know it works for you, Blanchette. I know it works for you because when you talk about this stuff and level these allegations against Omar, it um, it takes the heat off of you and uh, La Presse stories about your own uh, past uh, scandals and your denials on all that stuff. I know it plays to the nativist impulse in some of the voters in the province of Quebec, and that's all sweet spot for you politically, but it's shit. It is shit politics. It is shit behavior. Um, it is shit conduct. Um, uh, from just an individual in public life. Um, you're peddling things you know to be untrue in order to achieve political advantage. And I do think that's a core litmus test. I think that, and we talk about all these things are all parties. Saying things that you know are untrue because you think it will cash in a little advantage for you, I think is low, especially on this, where you're really trying to smear and tarnish somebody in the worst possible terms. So my hey you is to Blanchette, and uh, I wish you would just fuck off. Well, I'm going to follow up uh, uh, on uh, what we talked about earlier. My hey you is to Aaron O'Toole. Aaron is a, uh, a smart guy. I've known him for a long time. And uh, I would like to see a little bit more of uh, uh, being uh, the leader of the official opposition in terms of holding this government to uh, this government to account in terms of uh, uh, we're, we're still going on. I know that we talked about a budget upcoming, but we still have not had a budget in two then in close to two years. Uh, we are uh, we are behind uh, every other G7 country in terms of uh, uh, vaccinations. We're not saying procuring vaccinations, but actually uh, actually getting them. Um, as well as uh, the latest Keystone Division uh, decision, so by the Americans. So I would, uh, I would like to see Aaron uh, uh, pressing on some of those, uh, pressing the government on some of those issues. Excellent. Well, Scott told my took mine, so I was going to flip it around. I, I you know, I, I was going to tell Blanchette, you know, it's one thing to be an ass. Don't be a racist ass. But since you took mine, sorry, um, David, I didn't mean to take yours. I'm going to. It's fine. I mean, it's free ball. It's the most obvious one of the week. I'm going to flip it around and say to my friend Omar Al-Gabra, hey, you, don't let the bastards get you down. You're a great guy. You're a great Canadian. And you'll serve the country very well. And uh, don't let Blanchette's bullshit uh, uh, get you down. Take care. Um, all right, everybody. Thank you for listening. Scott, Jenny, thanks for your time again this week. So much fun every I, week. To talk I to have you a parting question for you guys. like this. What's I got a parting question for you guys. We're recording yeah. this before Trump issues his 100 pardons. Do you guys think that Maxwell will be among them? Like, is he also his health her? plan. Also his health yes, plan. Yes, that's right. It's, it's got to get it out under She's the. A, Do you think yeah. though that he? Just let Maxwell. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think he'll? Like, is that, I, is I, that I, actually a rumor? Is that actually being rumored? Yeah, well, they say that people are just driving trucks up to the north entrance of the White House and saying, here's the parcels of money, so, uh, you know, we'd like a pardon, please. I mean, she surely must have some hidden bank account. Um, I just think that would be, I know I'm being superficial, but my God, that would be something. You know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that out of office, Trump's care, Trump cares whether he's associated with Jeffrey Epstein or not. Probably proud of it. I don't think he gives a fuck. I think he cares about money, monetizing no, everything he can. Don't. All right. Hey, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you to our sponsors, especially TELUS, our presenting sponsor. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And if you have a chance to either go to the Apple website and give us a rating or a review or give us a shout-out on social media, it helps get the word around. We appreciate it. And until next week, take care of yourselves. <laughs>